Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. And a special greeting to Kenya. Mungu akubariki na sabato njema. Barikiwa na sabato njema pia. Santi for the health talk and thank you Rob for the Sabbath school. I've listened from start to finish. I've been here. So it's good to be with you. My name is Ingo Sorki, originally from Germany. I didn't grow up in a church. Well, I was Lutheran, but non-practicing. And then through a miracle and much prayer, I became an exchange student to the United States and became Seventh-day Adventist a long time ago, 1986, as a teenager. And I see you boys, the Royals. So I, I pray, well, what do I share with a group that I really don't know? By the way, when I'm looking down, I'm looking at you. And when you see my eyes, then I don't see you. But it is good to be with you. I really prayed, what do I share with you? I, I had several options, and the Lord impressed me to share something. It's a little bit related to the Trinity issue. Uh, and you know the Bible verse already, Revelation 14, verse 7. You've probably heard it many times. But let me share something with you that is fresh it is so fresh it is not even online yet but somebody sent the following to me and, and then i will pray again this is from adventistworld.org october 2023 it's not even october yet just published they haven't even posted online yet the godhead trinity Seventh-day Adventists believe there is one God and that this one God is three co-eternal persons who work together in unity. We fully embrace fundamental belief number two. By, by the way, this hour is, is not about directly Trinity and, and beating up the church. And But it, I just discovered this. Somebody sent it to me and it's a, a good bridge to my actual sermon. We fully embrace fundamental belief number two, which indicates that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have always been and always will be. The Godhead works in unison as one from eternity to eternity. Our triune God has implemented and is carrying out the plan of salvation for each of us. While we as human beings do not fully comprehend how this works, Scripture reveals everything we need to know. That is a good line. Scripture reveals everything we need to know. That's right. The Bible assures us the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. And then they list the classic verses. Genesis 126, I wrote the general conference about Genesis 126 because the May 11 Sabbath school contained a grievous error, I would say. It was stated in that. And we would not bring up worship, but Jesus did. John 4, verse 23, 24, Jesus mentions worship five times. And Ellen White confirms conversion loving obedience, and that is true worship. Now, if you put two and two together, that means true worship is only possible when you're converted. And I experienced that with a dog. It was a joyful relationship. When my German shepherd walked by my side without a leash, it wasn't forced. It wasn't, do I have to? Okay, I will, because there's a leash and a collar around me. It was voluntary. It was built on trust, and now the dog obeyed me. And I did not have to count to three. Now, you need to obey me by the count of three. None of that. It was one command, and the dog sat, stood still, shook hands, his paw, whatever. And that was a, 
a pleasant relationship between me and the dog when there was obedience and trust. So now we have what I would call the most important chapter Go on. in the Bible now for us, for our movement, every chapter is important, but we have Revelation chapter 14. And in Revelation chapter 14, I'm going to go backwards. We have two harvests. Harvest number one, good harvest. You want to be part of that. That's eternal life. That's new earth, new heaven, new earth, no more sin. The second harvest is a harvest to eternal destruction. You cease to exist. So this is important. And, and before that, God sends three messages. We call it the three angels' messages that lead to those two harvests. So they are the most important messages here at the end. And the first angel gives us three commands. Fear God, give glory to him, and worship him who. So, think this through. We, we have the final message by a final movement to the world. It is not a message to the church. It's a message by the church, by the movement to the world. And it only makes sense that an enemy would, an enemy hath done this, would want to mess this up. Because if I'm told to do three things before the end, and they then lead to the final outcome, I, I want to know what those three commands are. And they are, you know them, three angels' message. First angel is number one, fear God. Give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come. It is urgent. It's no longer day of judgment. It's hour of judgment. And then you have worship him who. So in Genesis 4.26, humanity starts calling upon the Lord. It's two chapters after the curse. We have a worship issue in the book of Daniel showing us that in the end, it will be a worship issue. We have one, two, three temptations with Jesus, and the third temptation is over worship. And as I'm discovering the last few years, the, the, the truth about the Father and the Son, I'm rediscovering for my personal life the, the richness and peace and beauty and also challenge to worship God and not just come with my prayer list from my calendar. The reason I, I mentioned that is it, personal, it's private. Uh, it's between me and God in my closet, secret service. But in the past, people have told me, Ingo, would you pray for me? And I say, yeah, and don't do it. You know, a lot of people say, pray for me, this and that. And we say, okay. And then we don't really do it. Have you been guilty of that? I have. And I got tired of really lying to people. You know, I say, I pray for you, and then I don't really follow up. So when somebody now seriously says, pray for me, this and that, I put it in writing. So my, my personal worship time with God is now actually worship time and then prayer requests. I've moved from please God to pleasing God. And let me tell you a secret. How do you spend time with God? The time is too short. I don't want to leave. I want to linger. I feel like Ellen White when she was taken in vision and, and saw the new earth and plucking flowers that don't wilt. She didn't want to go back um, to this planet. But I'm not quite done yet. I want to show you something. And not too long ago, I discovered now I was like, ah, oh, now it makes sense. That this message to worship God who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water and 1 Corinthians 8 verse 6 is perfect. I could talk a long time about that verse alone. I recently had a discussion with a scholar about this verse. For an elder 
who discovered the father-son truth and, of course, it stirred up a hornet's nest in a local church. But Acts chapter 4, verse 24. Just a few texts, and then I want to really show you something. Acts 4, 24. So when they heard that, when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them. For a long time, I thought Three Angels' message is a strange Adventist message apart from Jesus loves you and Bible and, and the general Christian package, but we have this extra thing. Guess what? Acts 4.24 shows that God, who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water and what is in them, is the message of the early church. It's not a new message. It's a return to the original. Let me give you a couple more examples. Acts 14, 15. We preach to you that you should turn from these useless things to the living God who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all things that are in them. Acts 17, 24. God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. Three times in a row in Revelation chapter 14, verse 7, we have a call to turn away from self, material things, this world, as in fear God, give glory to him, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of water. A very important little detail. Then we have Peter confessing Matthew 16, 16, you are the Christ, the son of the living God, which means the living God is the father. So my case, I got to tell you a story about this here in a minute. My case is that worship him who is a call to God the father. The three angels message is a father focused message. By his movement before the end that leads to the final harvest. I've had a good friend to me say, Well, Ingo, you can be non Trinitarian as long as you want, as long as you preach the three angels' message. So he was separating mission and three angels' message. As long as you preach that, he was focusing on mission at the expense of truth. So as long as you focus on three angels' message and the Advent mission, then we're okay. Do not let this theology thing distract you. The three angels' message, especially message number one, angel one, gives us three commands, and all three commands in a row are God the Father, God the Father, and God the Father. And I'm not minimizing Jesus Christ. But three times in a row, the final message going to the world that then leads to the fall of Babylon and the mark of the beast, we'll talk about that in two minutes, is a, a refocusing of the entire world to back to God the Father. The three angels' message is proactively anti-atheistic. And Brother Hewlett, if I get cut off again, don't hesitate to call. I'll keep an eye on the phone. And thank you for telling me that. When I lose you, you freeze. Jesus, Luke 10, 21 said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth. And then you heard Rob just read 1 Corinthians 8, 6. Yet for us, there is one God, the Father of whom are all things. We for him and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we are, through whom are all things and through whom we live. A scholar wanted to convince me from up high that Jesus is included in the Shema here. What are you talking about? The Shema is the highest confession of the Jewish faith. Deuteronomy 6 verse 4 in Hebrew, it says, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. And they're trying to sell us that this word one is a compound unity. And in 1 Corinthians 8 verse 6, Jesus is included in this one. God. That's not the case. Right? I have a detailed study on that, but if you just read 1 Corinthians 8, verse 6, it's one God, the Father, comma, 
and the Lord Jesus Christ. But we need one more step. I want to show you something. Yeah, think about this. The world starts worshiping the Lord. Well, part of it, a remnant in Genesis 4.26. We have Babylon, book of Daniel, false worship. It is the core issue in the book of Daniel telling us that's the end time issue. We have three temptations with Jesus and Satan. And the final temptation is over worship. Jesus meets a woman at the well. And the issue comes down to worship. Five times in John 4, verse 23, 24. I'm excited about this. And now we have three angels before the final harvest. And angel one has three commands. Fear God, give glory to him, and worship him who? Now, the highest confession of the Jewish people was and is, and a faithful Jew will say it twice a day, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. He, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Now follow me. It takes me about five minutes, but it's big stuff. Okay? And I think something will make sense to you. The highest confession of Judaism was this one statement. It is really only four words long. The Lord your God, the Lord is one, is four words in Hebrew. And two of those words are Jehovah. So we're down to really three words. Jehovah is repeated twice for emphasis. Right after this confession that Jehovah our God relationship, yeah, we're building a relationship, we're converted, and then comes the statement he's one, a, a strict, absolute, monotheistic statement. Strict monotheism. Deuteronomy 6 verse 4. The next step in Deuteronomy 6 verse 5 is what? Deuteronomy 6 verse 5. Well, you have, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength. Deuteronomy 6 5. Confirmed by Jesus himself. Confirmed in Mark 12, verse 30, and Matthew 22, verse 38. I got to fix that in my document. This is the first and great commandment. So I'm, I'm building a chain here, and we need every step. We have the highest confession of the Old Testament, the Tanakh. The Lord your God, the Lord is one. Out of that comes this one God you shall love. With everything you have, can love be commanded? Yes, we have fallen so low that God has to command love, but it's a solicitation. Because I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. I've done something for you. I've redeemed you. I've rescued you. Come on, therefore now, as your God relationship and rescue, redemption, I want you to return this love and respond to my love to you. So, are you getting the picture? We have the highest confession, Deuteronomy 6 verse 4. We have the highest command, the first command, the greatest command, love the Lord your God. Out of that comes love to your neighbor. I just listened to a theologian here in Texas a couple of weeks ago who argues that because God is love, God has to be a plurality. Now, love cannot exist alone. That, that is philosophical, humanistic reasoning. Put that aside. 1 John 4, verse 8, God is love. 1 John 4, 16, God is love is a direct statement of God the Father is love. And because he loves us, he sent us his son. 1 John 4, verse 9, in this you know God's love, that he gave us his son. That is true love. It's God the Father loving us, therefore he gave us his son. No philosophical Trinitarian language at all in the Bible text. All right, how does this continue? Parents, listen up. I'm a parent, two grown sons. We have the highest confession that God is one. Out of that comes the highest command to humanity, two laws that encapsulates the entire law and the prophets. Love the Lord your God with everything you got. 
And out of that comes love your neighbor as well. There, what else is there in life? Loving God and loving your neighbor. Now watch what the next step is. We need a couple more steps. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 7, parents are now told, you shall teach them what? These commands to love the Lord your God and your neighbor, which comes out of God is one. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. Now, here's true youth ministry. I have witnessed youth ministry. I've done it myself. Youth ministry taking the youth away from the parents, buying pizza, putting them in a gym, and calling it youth ministry. No, youth ministry is at home, 24-7, teaching your children that God is one and we love the Lord our God right? with our mind, with our heart, with our strength and our neighbor. We, we teach our children that 24-7, cross-generational, not separating the children from the youth, from the adults, from the older folk, but together, the entire village coming together. I'll share a secret with you. My wife and I planted a church in 2014. And for one year, we did no pathfinders. We did no evangelism. We did no programs. We prayed. And on Wednesday night, we had as many people at prayer meeting as we had church members because everybody showed up to pray. We did not have a children's program. We did not have a youth program. We all got together together. And we prayed together and the children prayed and the youth prayed and the older folk prayed. Older folk is 90 and up. And it was beautiful and God performed miracles. We, we saw God at work, all generations together. Now, one more step. This is so important that God tells us to do something now. You still got all the puzzle pieces together? Highest confession of Judaism in the Old Testament for us too, that God is one, period. End of discussion. God is one, not a plurality. Um, the highest command comes out of that, that we love the Lord our God, this one God. We love him with everything we have. We love our neighbor as well. Teach that to your children, to the next generation, to your grandchildren. 24-7, not two hours Saturday night after sundown with pizza. Now, here comes one more step. God says, this is so important to me. I want you to do the following. Then I take a look at the chat. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 8 and 9. Adventists, listen carefully. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand. They shall be as frontlets between your eyes, forehead. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your ga gates. Let me go backwards. You shall put them on your doorposts. That reminds me of Passover. Putting the highest confession and your love towards God and your love towards your neighbor and teaching that to your children. Putting all that on your doorpost is your ticket out of Egypt. That's your Passover. It's, it's your exodus. It's we're leaving planet Earth. We're headed towards a new Earth and a new heaven. We need to get out of here. Don't invest too much into this world. It's temporary. It's all going to burn. But what you can keep is your character. And that character is built on you recognizing that God is one. You love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. You love your neighbor. You teach that to the next generation. You put that on your doorpost. And did you catch that? You put that information on your hand and between your eyes, which is your frontal lobe. You now have a mark of the best in your life. That mark is that God is one and you love him 
and you love your neighbor. It is a love-based message and it goes on your hand and it goes on your forehead. Does that sound familiar? The highest message coming out of Deuteronomy and then repeated by angel number one, fear God, give glory to him and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water that needs to go on your forehead. No wonder Satan has a counterfeit. People have told me the Trinity issue, Ingo, why are you wasting time on that? It is splitting hair. It is just semantics. Can't you focus on something more important, a heavenly sanctuary, the LGBTQ issue? I'm working on a sermon on that. It is hitting Germany hard right now, the whole world, but Germany in particular. Can't, can't you focus on that? I'm told by scripture that our number one confession is the Lord our God is one. Our highest command, the entire Old Testament law and the prophets summarized is love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your strength, and love the, your neighbor as yourself. Teach that to your children. And it is so important that we're going to describe that in a Passover setting, Exodus, coming out of Egypt, and put it on your hand and on your forehead. Satan says, I recognize the importance of this. I will ruin that with a false articulation of God. And I will make this so important that people will put it on their hand and on their forehead. And it's called the mark of the beast. Of course, Sabbath ties into that because where does worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water? I'm almost done. Where does that come from? That's a direct quote out of Exodus chapter 20, verse 11. I have a secular Greek New Testament Bible right on my shelf over here. And there are cigar smoking and beer drinking scholars who put that together. And they recognized that the Old Testament background to Revelation chapter 14, verse 7 is the Sabbath commandment. But it's not just about which day. The question is, which Lord? See, Revelation 14, verse 7 says, thou shalt not break the Sabbath. It says, worship him who, and then reminds us of the Sabbath. Because behind the Sabbath, and, and you keeping Sabbath holy, is your recognition of who is God in your life. Put that on your hand and on your forehead. That is why we have a mark of the beast. It, it doesn't just want to ruin a day. It wants to ruin God in our lives. D does that make sense? So the three angels message is a caution to the world by the Advent movement. It's not a message to the Advent movement. Now it is. We have something got messed up profoundly in our movement. But it was meant to be a message of who truly is God. Who do you love? How do you love your neighbor then? You love God first, then your neighbor. It's a message caution. There's a counterfeit by an enemy. I want to tell you two quick stories and we'll close. You can ask me questions. I really need to go to another group, but they can wait. I read then Revelation chapter 14, verse 9, and God says, caution, warning. Babylon is making the entire world drunk. And, and I have ex-alcoholics in my church, a church I used to pastor, and they say you cannot reason with a drunk. It, it loosens the fatty tissue in your brain, and you can't think anymore. The, the world is intoxicated okay, with a false doctrine. Grapes are good. And then Satan takes them and ferments them and ruins humanity. That's why, why alcohol and wine is such a fitting picture for false doctrine. And I want to tell you two quick stories. Personal experience. I thought, Ingo, I can't just preach this. I need to live it. I was a hospice chaplain. I'm visiting a dying lady. I talk to her, hold her hand, sit with her. And then on my way out, her son grins at me. 
This was several years ago. And her son says, hey, preacher, he called me father. I told him, don't do that. And he calls me priest. I said, I'm no priest. He says, preacher, what's going on in the world? This was during COVID. I I'm still visiting people. Yeah. Ministry doesn't stop because of the world. Uh, I'm visiting. And he says, what's going on in the world? And I said, do you really want to know? He said, yeah, what's going on? I said, I'm going to tell you something. It's going to get worse. And he's still grinning, but it's serious. He says, what am I supposed to do? And he says, okay, it's getting late in Kenya. I'll keep that in mind. Hang in there three, four more minutes. He says, what am I supposed to do? And I, and I thought at that moment, my normal response would be, Jesus is love. He loves you. Treat your neighbor nice. You know, commandment number two, they're the same level, but the, the kind of love, grace message. I thought, this is my chance. We have a message that needs to go to the world. This guy is world. I took a napkin, a dirty napkin, took out my pen, and I said, I'm going to write down something for you. Do this, and you'll be okay. He said, okay. I have a secular person smoking, drinking beer, grinning at me in an underwear t-shirt. I'm on my way out to another patient to visit. And I thought, this is my chance. I wrote down the three angels message, fear God, give glory to him and worship him who in, in simplified language reference, Revelation 14, 6, 7, I gave it to him. I said, do this. You can store food. You can buy gold. You can't eat gold. You need to do this. The Bible says, do this. Fear God, give glory to him, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of water. Springs of water is a reminder of the flood. That means the world is coming to an end. I said, do this. I don't know what he understood. I don't know what he's doing now. I don't know what he did with a napkin, but I'm excited to wait for heaven to find out if he made it. If if he accepted God's offer of salvation in his son, Jesus Christ. Yeah, I'll, I'll probably find out in heaven. I thought we are told to give the world this message. Let me try it on a napkin. So I don't know how then this developed. I was teaching Sabbath school in an Adventist church as a non-Trinitarian, very carefully you know, Paul went back to the synagogue until he got kicked out. And we got to the end of the lesson, and I saw the force of what I just told you the last 20 minutes. Two-minute story. We got to the end of the lesson, and we were, as a class, I was not the leader. I no longer hold office, no longer ordained, can no longer teach or preach in the church. But I, I was able to teach Sabbath school here and there. Well, the following happened. The class started discussing, this was two, three years ago, still pretty fresh. The class started discussing what should we study next? And a sister said, you know, I've been Adventist all my life. I've always heard about the three angels message. And she said, I have no idea what that is. She said, I know it's Revelation 14, fear God, give glory to him, Babylon, Mark of the Beast. She said, I don't understand it. Uh, I don't know what it means. Three angels message. We're supposed to tell the world the three angels message and I don't know what it means. That's what she said. The teacher said, why don't we study that? I said, that's brilliant. You know, the teacher turned to me and said, Ingo, would you introduce the three angels message next Sabbath in class? We will study that the next few months. What is three angels message? I said, that's great. I would love to do that. I said, homework. I said, we don't have a Sabbath school quarterly on it. Now, Previous one was on the three angels message, but this was two years ago, me in class. I said, I, I want you to read Revelation 14 and come back with a question. Who are the 144,000? What is the mark of the beast? What is Babylon? What does it mean to fear God? Anything. I said, I'll give you an example. And I did not have Trinity debate in mind. I said, I want to know if the Bible says before the end, fear God, give glory to him and worship him. Who? Worship him who made heaven and earth. 
I want to know if that is important, looks important to me. If that is so important, I want to know what him means. Who is him? Is that the father? Is that the son? Is that both together? That would be my question as an example. Everybody was fine. The next Sabbath, I got to Sabbath school. I had a one-page handout prepared on the three angels message. The teacher said, we're not discussing three angels message. We're going to study last day events. I got everybody a book and, and without, I was stunned. He hadn't talked to me. Nobody had talked to me about it. We changed the subject. I called him up that afternoon. I said, brother, what? it's okay to study last day events. I mean, the, the book compilation, last day events. But I thought we're studying three angels message. He was afraid Trinity would come up, that I was pushing the class in a certain direction. I said, all I want to know is worship him. Who is him? Honest question. He said, well, we're not studying three angels message. Wow. You know why I think that happened? Right here. The issue of worship incites the fury of Satan. He knows that if the church discovered the truth and, and really got down to understanding, fear God and give glory to him and worship him who, and I think I can biblically prove that him is the father, that this movement would bring this world to an end. Yep. That is the power. And so at any turn that I can see now, the church is stopping it. I couldn't teach three angels message in an Adventist church. Can you believe that? I wrote a letter to the general conference, several brethren, that there was an error in the Sabbath school lesson on the three angels message. No response. No response. Because I see that the issue of worship is, is the final call by this movement to the world. So I want to end on a positive note. It then gets repeated in Revelation chapter oh, 14. Then it gets repeated in Revelation chapter 15. 15 verse 4. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. For all nations shall come and all nations, all nations shall come and worship before you for your judgments have been ma manifested. Re Revelation chapter 15, verse 4. I'll close with two texts and pray, and, and then we go from there. It's one o'clock. Yeah. Ephesians chapter 3, 14. Just discovered that from a German brother. I've read the Bible cover to cover more than once, but you you know you discover these Bible texts <laughs> and, and they grab you. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14. Oh, beautiful. We just finished studying Ephesians in the nominal churches as Sabbath school lesson. Ephesians 3, 14. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then one more text, and it works best in King James. Acts chapter 24, verse 14. Here it is. Acts 24, if I remember correctly. Just came to me, I ought to read this text. Yes, I close with this text. And it works better in King James because the word in all other translations is sect. But King James picks up the word heresy from the Greek. It'll make sense. Here it is. But this I confess unto thee that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers. Believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. And I have made that my custom response when people come and say, you don't believe in Jesus anymore. Silly phrases like that. They're silly. Silly rumors. I say, I believe everything about God and his son that's written in scripture and in the spirit of prophecy. Good. 
I have hope towards God, which they themselves also allow that they shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and unjust. Herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. But I, I just love this Acts 14, 24. This I confess unto you that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. Brothers and sisters, a lot of theology, a lot of Bible verses. Personally, from Ingo to you, I have discovered the worship of God. And it is filling my heart. Let me pray with you and then we see where we go from here. I can stick around a little bit, but I really need to go to another group. We're having a testimony Sabbath with a bunch of people. I'm checking the chat, see if I miss anything. Yeah. All right. Let me pray with you. The best we can do together is pray. I hope you have rediscovered prayer in your life. But let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, what a privilege. Undeserved privilege to come before you through the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Yeah, we don't deserve to be in your presence, yet we may call upon you in worship. Oh God, there it is. So much in our lives that doesn't belong, take it from us. Replace it with your grace, faith, and love for hope. And we discuss so much theology on Facebook and internet and YouTube amongst each other. I'm afraid the Samaritans fall by the wayside. Renew a spirit of mission among us where we actually reach people outside our, our movement and circles. And we want to pray that you and our love for you is marked on our hands and on our forehead, unmistakably, on our way out of Egypt. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. Thank you that we can trust you yesterday and today and surely tomorrow, including in the dark. But we have your light and we thank you for it. I pray for your special blessing on the people that were here in this chat digitally and this worship meeting. Challenges, insurmountable problems for some, difficulties, question marks unanswered. I pray you walk with us into a new week is our prayer in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Uh, thank you, folks. Asante. Amen. Karibu. Thank you.